I think we'll uh, call the uh, April 8th Finance uh, Committee meeting uh, to order. Uh, Juanita, please take roll. Juliet Boyd. Present. Randy Brockway. Rachel Morella. Michael O'Brien. Present. Arthur Perry. Rich Regan. Present. And Mary Rose Mandia. Present. And the motion passed. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I see that there's no, I, I did not grab the None. time. There, there are no public comments. Mm -hmm. So with that, we'll uh, get a presentation about the Central Hauser repaving project. Go ahead. You have a handout um, in front of you. Uh, this was also in your board materials. I'll turn it right over to Paul. He's ready. Invited architects, and we'll go through the materials. All right, so um, basically on the, on the cover letter we're talking about, so in terms of the update, since um, since the last time we had a couple meetings uh, talking about the projects, we met with um, Board Member Brockway out here to, to look at the areas. Um, there were some um, questions were brought up about whether we include some permeable pavers, some sustainable things in the area, and we were looking at potential opportunity spaces for that. Um, so we had met out here, talked about the proposed work for the summer, um, and we're going to basically to have base and alternate bids for certain areas. So the main, the main lot, the main central lot, uh, and it's in the diagram. I believe it's called. Um, let's see what area we're at. I think it's area three on your diagram. That'll be. It's in green on the last page. Uh, that's that is uh, the base bid work. Um, the area between the church and central, uh, where we where we talk about future outdoor classroom. One of the concepts that we had talked about with Mr. Brockway was potential for outdoor learning space. And we were trying to identify spots that we could potentially develop uh, outdoor learning courtyards, which Robin uh, will get more information to you on that. Um, I don't know if you would. Well, I was going to say, in the interest of brevity, and since it's not a part of the uh, summer work, we can defer a presentation. I was prepared to give you maybe a 10 minute presentation on the importance of outdoor learning with some concepts and ideas. But since it's not a part of the summer work, we could wait and table it and do it another time, if you'd like. As long as it's after May 5th, that's okay with me. <laughs> okay. All right, no worries. Do we, can do, we can do that. Um, all right, so basically we talked about that, but even with that piece of it, we did, did still talk about um, potential for doing su some sustainable uh, per pavers. Uh, we thought a good opportunity spot was along um, the building along the back here, along a door six entry. It's also brought up the concept or, or the importance of um, uh, handicap accessibility back here to try to do something to improve that. So as part of that piece, we'll look at doing a, a stair, extend the, you know, the extend a, a sidewalk area out from the door, uh, have a step coming in that would line up and have a, a striped area in front of it, and then work on having some sloped walkway that would not be a ramp so we wouldn't need handrails. Uh, so that we can transition up uh, for so accessibility. To make uh, door six an accessible entry and Correct. more attractive. It's having planters right. on either side. Yeah, we're looking at having some planter areas on either side, which we would maybe do. Uh, the, the, the plans for that could be done either out of the allowance or separate um, by the school, uh, however you guys want to handle that. Uh, but basically then the bid strategy for that would be that we'd have the main lot three would be your uh, base bid, and we'll have allowances in there to cover any unsuitable soils because we did when we're going through all the reports. Um, so we'll specify removal of that. And then the other areas would be full depth, but uh, so areas one, which is the driveway along uh, the north end of the building, and um, area two, which would be your uh, paved, your main parking lot, would be taken as alternate bids. You reviewed area three for the, the semi trailer. Correct. Uh, That's going to be. The, the, that, and that will be full depth. Is that right? Um, well, actually, there, because in that area, the, the borings actually were pretty good. The asphalt thickness and the stone, uh, we believe, to be acceptable. So, what we'll do is we'll call for that to be stripped, completely strip off the paving, proof roll it, um, address any soft areas if there are, and then repave. Um, but the areas we did think. This access drive and the parking area back here, we do believe we need to do a full depth on that. So we'll, 
um, those areas. That's and that'll also be part of the. It'll just be part of the uh, built into it. So that's how we'll manage costs on it. What was the thought process behind area one and area two? Are they just not as bad shape as area three? And area three is just the. I think it was a way to. It was a way to uh, phase it because when we first talked about the do total dollars for the project, um, depending on where everything fell, uh, we were concerned with overall project cost. So the and, and those yeah not as bad. I mean this uh, area area three um, or I'm sorry area two. Uh, there is a lot of patchwork there. I mean it, it would make sense to do. Um, it's I believe we just had an electrical service looks that was recently put in and there's a lot of patching there. So um, and I guess it's just more of a, a bid strategy in case numbers come in. If numbers come in great and we can afford it all and do it all. All right. I'll uh, be kind of at your at your guys' le leisure on that in terms of. And there will be a, a bid that is all encompassing. Correct. To yeah, we'll have a base bid, and then the alternate bids would be. For, you would have, a, you would have a, an opportunity for a, a con contractor to submit a bid for all areas. Well, that would be their base bid. Would be their ba the base bid. Every contractor would give you a price for the base bid, and a price for each alternate. So they're all part of the same project. It would, we wouldn't award. We wouldn't award the base bid to one guy and an alternate to another guy. The alternate would be part of. We did just ask each contractor for a separate price to address that. I've got a question for you. You're sure. in this uh, spreadsheet you put together. You have a column for full depth and a column for strip and pave. Yes. Won't you be specifying what you want each contractor to do? Yes. Okay, so you're identifying a range here. This is more it's more of a cost range. Got it. But you're but with each contract you're saying, you know, area three, I want full depth in this Correct. square footage, strip and pave in this square footage. Yeah, again, this was this was put more together as part of the overall budget so we had an idea where, you know, this could be our low range if things turn out well and yep. high range if, if they don't. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Is there any other any other questions? Uh, Paul, at the uh, at this entrance, uh, the back door entrance that we're yes. talking about, mm -hmm. uh, are there going going to be uh, curb stops as there are now? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what we'd have to do in, in terms of this, what, I'm not sure if when you popped in if you got in between the beginning part. But we, what we'd have is uh, we do need to have a barrier. That if you some sort of a barrier curb, not a barrier curb, but a, a separator curb of, of concrete, to you know to hold in the uh, hold in the pavers. I see. So we wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't put the pavers, you wouldn't dye the asphalt right into the side of the pavers. Right. Uh, so there's going to be a curb then. Not an actual raised curb, but oh, flush. A flush curb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the idea there would be you'd have a, one step up in that center, that centers on door six. You'd have one step up, and then. The two ramps going off on either side would be at one twenty, so we wouldn't have to have any handicap, any ramps. I mean, not it wouldn't be a handicap ramp; it would be a, a normal uh, pitch walk that we wouldn't have to have handrails. Great, very good. I see you've uh, you've kind of repositioned the handicap parking as well. Right, and I, I do have to. We'll have to when we look at the overall site plan. We still have to go through it all. Um, you do have four out there now. Um, the question would be if, if you want to keep those, any of those down where they're at, or if we want to get, try and get them all here near the door. Okay. Um, we can reposition them, and we can have some on either side. So right now it's set up where we could have two alternate spots on either side of the uh, the striped area. So. And all of our handicap spaces will be uh, load spaces for vans. Or will they're all yeah, they're all pretty much. They'll be full size, nine foot, nine foot, mm -hmm. striped off on either side. So. And then in terms of the bike racks, we can we'll work with staff to pick bike racks. We can do an allowance for them and, and have them held so that we can select something that you want. I, this is just an example of what we you know what we can do. We can also do something very similar to what you have now, but um, the thought would be if we're doing the pavers there, we would replace the racks. Makes sense. Are we still in good shape with respect to getting this work done um, um, this summer? Yeah, I think we'll be, you know, it may be a challenge. I mean, obviously, bit with bidders, but a lot of times the pavers are used to seeing work come out at this time. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll get good coverage. Okay. Um, but in terms of getting it, getting it done from our standpoint and getting the documents out, we're on track. 
Uh, would it slow us down if we accepted area one, two, and three completing in on time? or? Um, I don't think so. I think in the time frame we have, it's just a matter of it, as long as they know what they're doing ahead of time. Okay. Do you think, I mean, time frame wise? I don't think they can get it done as long as, as, long as we uh, get that good day. We get the good mm -hmm. All right. What is your pre bid meeting? I don't notice that on your. Uh, well, pre bid would have, well, what we'll do as soon as the documents are out to bid. A couple days later, we'll have a pre-bid meeting, which is which we have. We'll contact contractors, and we'll, it also gets advertised. Um, we'll have that with. We have a, a pre-meeting with all the contractors. A pre-bid will be before the end of April. Yes. Yeah, I think I think I have it. It's in the. It'll be in the advertisement. So I'm, I'll get that to you, probably next Monday. Okay. I think it's the plan right now. And that'll have the pre-bid meeting dates and all that. Yeah. All right. All right. We're good to go. I appreciate this time and putting everything together, and look forward to uh, seeing the bids and getting this process started because it's uh, sorely needed. So appreciate yeah, the good work. Thank you. You're welcome. I should mention something about this project. Uh, we're, we've had life safety. Uh, uh, we're starting a life safety amendment process that will be brought to the board's attention in the future. Um, the architect is, will be filing an amendment with the only State Board of Education, and approximately a couple hundred thousand dollars of this will be funded through life safety. And this, is a, this is a clearly eligible uh, cost. It's one of those that they, that they list as examples of of life safety eligible projects. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll now move on to item two, the uh, iPad pilot uh, program update uh, from, from Don. Uh, my number this uh, will not be a regurgitation of our last uh, uh, presentation of what was like 25 or 26 slides. Yes. More, more of an update to, to keep uh, brief and see where we're at on this. Thank you. Um, good evening. Just want to give a quick update on the, uh, the, the pilot process. Uh, last time I gave an overview of the Chromebook and uh, essentially it's the same format. Did not republish some of the same information uh, leading up to the actual feedback from the, 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 the teachers or the teacher and the, the students. Um, overall, very, very positive feedback from uh, the uh, uh, teacher and the students using the devices. Um, uh, the, you know, some, some of the benefits were, you know, the, the ability to very easily, quickly and easily publish content. Um, I, I think there's also was some, a lot of transfer of knowledge in terms of some of the, the applications that that they could access because many of the applications that you can use on an iPad are the same applications that they can use on the MacBook. They have iPad apps. So there's a lot of applications and resources that there was a level of familiarity with as well. Um, the, uh, you know, some of the same benefits or positive feedback regarding the, the Chromebook in terms of uh, length of battery. Um, the uh, uh, easy, you know, the the weight of the device, the, the transportability of the device was also uh, a big positive uh, on uh, the, the 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 iPad. Um, the students really enjoyed the touchscreen. They really liked interacting with uh, the touchscreen on the devices, um, and uh, uh, there there was uh, um, uh, you know the, in terms of using a keyboard, some of them were. You know, the feedback was that the keyboard was, because uh, it's a soft keyboard, although uh, with the device, if it were actually considered as a as a one-to-one -one device, we would need to uh, invest in external keyboards for, for certain types of, for instance, like for park testing, you would have to have an external keyboard in order to, to take the park test on, on the device. Um, uh, as far as, uh, you know, again, over overall, um, iPads uh, can be utilized uh, uh, for, for most projects uh, that the teacher had done in the past, and um, 
the, the teacher really saw some amazing capabilities with the device as a uh, as a creation tool, which is uh, you know a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from from Apple and even from other school districts is that that's why a lot of school districts have gone in this direction is because of the ease of use and the ability to really create uh, uh, projects and so forth using using the device. Um, <clears throat> As, as far as the feedback from students, uh, they, the feedback from these students on these devices, if you were to compare directly with the Chromebook, the feedback on the iPads was a lot more positive on, on the iPads. They really enjoyed using it for uh, the, the variety of applications that, uh, that they used. Um, it, as far as uh, device cost, it is uh, less than the MacBook, a little bit more costly than the uh, than the Chromebook, <clears throat> but from a uh, from a repair cost, uh, it, it's actually they are a lot easier to maintain. Um, obviously, you need uh, from a protective case in order to protect the screen. Screen damage is the highest, uh, uh, the the most uh, common type of breakage with an iPad is the, a cracked screen. It's usually from being dropped, uh, but but with any in any one to one deployment. We'd want to make sure that it had a, a good, solid, protective screen on it. Replacement parts, um, replacement parts, very affordable when compared to uh, the uh, the other devices, uh, and also um, different. Some 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 items can't be repaired. A, a, a hard drive, they really don't do a replacement of a hard drive on the device. Uh, but in terms of screen, uh, battery, very very comparable uh, to to the other devices. Uh, but, but again, the, the, the feedback from the repair centers that I've talked to and from Apple is that that screen damage is the most, the most common. Um, as, as far as, as next steps, uh, really is to, to review the information with uh, the tech steering committee and with administration. The, you know, having a non-laptop format device could present some challenges, especially at the middle school, and that's what we want to uh, really talk with uh, administrators at, uh, at those buildings. But, it is a device that is being more and more uh, commonly deployed in one-to-one -one programs, as is the Chromebook. As I think as some environments are moving away from, from a MacBook, uh, the, the, uh, the iPad um, or a tablet type device is becoming one of more the devices of choice, as is, as is the Chromebook. Uh, I think another reason for that is because it is seen as a kind of a lifelong device. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of us have either a uh, uh, some type of portable, whether it's a phablet, a large tablet, or uh, a full, uh, a full form uh, 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 tablet device, that is is kind of what's seen as an everyday device uh, throughout life. Um, uh, so again, we will uh, again gather additional information through talking with administration, get some feedback from the tech steering committee, and then uh, look to have a recommendation at the uh, 421 board meeting. All right. Any, any questions? Thank you, John. Uh, next on our, uh, our list is a um, review uh, of the uh, demographer that we hired, the uh, Casarda report um, that uh, we all received in our uh, board book. So the, any further ado, David. Well, the, uh, this is a, a study that has a lot of uh, substance behind it. But if you want to know where to focus your energies, um, you know, I, I would spend time with, with the text, uh, read Dr. Casarda's explanations. His, um, I think he, he makes some, some interesting comments, but on page 62 of the, of the document, uh, we have our Series B projection. Uh, series B is uh, that the enrollments will occur as anticipated. And I, I think the past discussion about this topic was uh, that this would be a helpful planning tool. And this uh, page 62, I believe, rings true with that because if you, if you take the uh, enrollment increase that he's projecting from 1516 to 1617, and were to assume that that was the carbinger of the future, one would be overestimating uh, future enrollments. What he's saying in, on this page is that we're going to 
basically peak in 1617 and then and then go down. Uh, the K through 6 will go from 593 in 1516 to 654, but then that's the largest number that you see going all the way out to 2425. School district as a whole will hit a peak of 1737 and then pretty much be relatively flat. So the I think this is a you know this is favorable from the standpoint of of uh, you know being able to plan for the future because this is this does not sound an alarm about future enrollment increases. And so you know at this point in time the administration is still in the process of reviewing this document. Um, we, we had a couple questions, but, but basically we're accepting Dr. Casarda's expertise, his methodologies, and um, I, I'd say a, a year from now we need to uh, see what these numbers look like, and, and uh, if we have uh, a variance, then get back to him and, and make sure that that we're, uh, we're still in conformity with what he has uh, documented in this study as what we, we can anticipate. That's, that's, that's about as much of a summary as I uh, can offer right now. Okay. Well, it's something to keep in mind as we plan because there's always been a uh, board before me and uh, this board, we've always uh, had a hard time trying to figure out uh, class enrollment policy, and the easiest thing we've always done is uh, uh, override it. So hopefully with uh, this study that we paid for, we'll have a better idea of what to do. The, the next board can uh, hopefully tackle this issue because it's always been one that's been, uh, that, that can has been kicked down the road um, uh, many times. So any questions on the enrollment, or are we going to move off that? I was just going to ask him, um, um, and again, I guess, Mike, uh, you're the only one here from the prior boards, or artisan here, but h hasn't the predictions been it was going to be peaked in the past? Uh, it, it, absolutely. Um, but I recall from our last discussion, every demographer that has, has been hired has said it's always going to peak and, and don't worry about it. Uh, but at the same time, as David pointed, I think in, the, in our, one of our meetings about this and talking with him, uh, it all depends, and it goes with the methodology. I think the last uh, enrollment report we did, the guy uh, used to uh, assume that pin numbers were going to stay the same on property value uh, on property numbers, and it was it was faulty logic to to begin with. Uh, whereas this one, uh, as David recommended to us, why to go with Casarda? Uh, he was more expensive, but his Methodology is, is he's you know well, uh, well renowned, so hopefully uh, his projections will be spot on. I think if I can add something here, these are all still based on a number of assumptions, mm -hmm. and I, I this board still needs to sit down and digest this document mm -hmm. and make sure we concur with the assumptions that were made. Um, you know, as we use something like this to to you know to project what our district needs are for the future. I agree with that, and apparently this is a different set of, uh, well, just it's a different methodology than used in the past. I, I think one of the important findings uh, that I saw in reading it was uh, how the district has changed over the last 15 years. We've gone from a 90% non-Hispanic in 2001 to 65%. Uh, non-Hispanic in 2014. So that's that's a major demographic change that um, is uh, is happening throughout many school districts in the country, but certainly um, it is happening here as well. One page to uh, focus on, you know, in addition to that table is on page 33 where he, uh, Dr. Sarri did the you know, a narrative on what he titles the enrollment future of District 96, and he, he cites a table that he has included in the materials that used uh, birth trends from 1980 to 2009, which was the latest year available. This is the kind of information that he's accustomed to incorporating in his 
in the studies. Um, I'd have to look at how this was you know, handled by a previous demographer. You know, I think he's using statistical information, information from, from county records that um, you know, has helped him hone and improve his methodology over the years. Okay. Very good. Um, 2015-2016 uh, preliminary budget is our next item. Um, I, I'd like to make sure everyone has a hard copy of this using the uh, materials that is still here. Copies over there on the counter. This one up. The 15-16 uh, budget is in the very earliest stages of development. This is really just one step beyond what uh, was presented when we reviewed budget preparation materials. Um, and this is a board finance committee meeting, so it's a, it's a good idea to just recap. Um, some of the major components of what will go into the 15-16 budget. So I'm starting out with what is you know, the usual um, executive summary at the beginning to show you what, what kind of a, a anticipated balance of revenues minus expenditures. 15-16 is looking uh, like a really strong fiscal year in the operating funds. Again, when I talk about the operating funds, Educational operations and maintenance, <coughs> toward immunity, uh, transportation, IMRF, and working cash combined. Uh, the uh, on page three of the materials, I've provided the um, This is, the, this is the financial projection percentages for every uh, cost category and revenue category. Um, the, the challenge at this point in time when you're doing a financial projection is to just make sure that these, from a, from a, a broad perspective, make sense. And so I'm sharing the percentages that are built into the projection. And at the end of uh, 1920, uh, the balance projected is 1,023,585 uh, in the red. So as, as time goes on, these are conservative projections of, re of revenues and expenditures, uh, but it looks like in, in the early years, we're rock solid, but starting in 2017-18, if these trend lines continue on the same path, then we would have to um, uh, either either look at uh, increased revenues to offset expenditures, or we would have to be grappling with a reduction in our cumulative fund balance and running a deficit. Um, on page four, the development of the current fiscal year is is presented, and the budget anticipated a. Um, Balance of revenues minus expenditures of 1.141 million, uh, 608 prior to a transfer to the debt service fund. So basically, we're, we were in a balanced budget. Uh, we've had $732,000 of favorable development, mostly in uh, lesser expenditures. Uh, uh, salaries coming in under budget benefits slightly under budget and then in the operations and maintenance fund the purchase services budget was adopted at a, at a level that was um, inherently high and the um, past practice of the school district was to charge capital outlay and facilities improvements to purchase services and that's that's changing uh, the Illinois program accounting manual calls those capital outlay items 
So, let's see. Uh, I'd like to recap uh, major source of, the major source of revenue for the school district is, is the property tax levy on page six. And uh, this is the adopted levy uh, that the board uh, is, we're now waiting for the results. A levy is a request. The county is in the process of uh, working with the state of Illinois and a multiplier will be published. And then we will know uh, within probably two months what has happened. Uh, the preliminary uh, indicators from uh, the Riverside Assessor's Office is that the EAV is coming at about 441 million which is just slightly above what was built into this. Mm -hmm. So that's the best information that we have at this point, um, but we're, you know, we're still in a, in a position of, of significant uncertainty regarding what that final uh, EAV will be and what will be the final number on the property. Um, let's see. I did also want to uh, recap on page seven. Uh, how the tax bills break out and what what is the uh, what is the average tax bill um, up at the top of the page uh, the, the tax bill for homeowners that's residential property exclusively not commercial industrial uh, is well seven thousand nine hundred and two dollars in tax year 2013 seven thousand nine hundred fifty four dollars in twelve in 2012 is seven thousand eight hundred thirty-two dollars in twenty eleven. Do you see that where I'm going across the top? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. that's and of that total tax bill, uh, District ninety six is forty three point one two percent, or forty three point four five percent, or forty two point seven four percent of the I have the total tax bill. Uh, the fair market value of a of a home has declined. And I think this was, you know, part of our previous discussion from tax year 2011 at 325,800 down to 279,600 in the most recent uh, tax year. The, the tax revenues for the school district are protected by the tax cap and as the, as the EAV has declined by approximately 30% over the past three or four years, that that decline of 30% in EAV has caused our tax rates to hit their maximums, which is what we've talked about multiple times in the past. I'd like to emphasize that uh, if property values come back uh, for the for the 15 levy, if all of a sudden the what they do is market uh, ratio studies, taking actual sales of homes, and that's how they calculate the multiplier. If for some reason sales of homes come back and prices are being you know, better commanded in the marketplace, for the 15 levy we'll still see an increase of only 0.8%. Right. So we could go back from an average of 279,600 to 325,800, a significant increase in value, but our property tax revenues would only go up 0.8 percent because that's what that's the locked-in CPI for the 2015 levy. So that's that's an important uh, concept to keep in mind. Uh, at one point, there was uh, uh, I, I read something in the landmark about an expectation about uh, you know the average uh, tax bill of the community is 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 very high. So I, I calculated at the bottom of the page that if your tax bill is $10,000, then you have a home value of 476,000 in the most recent year. If you had a tax bill of $10,000 in 2012, it would have been 464,573. If you had a tax bill of $10,000, your home would be $575,000 in value. And so so that those are those are uh, those are fair market values of homes that are significantly above the average. And the average home values are the 279, 299, and 325. So keeping in mind what is, what is uh, you know, a high tax versus medium tax versus low tax in terms of the burden, 
on the homeowner. That's what this, this page is intended to, to, you know, to provide some kind of perspective on that. Uh, on page eight, I am just sharing a format. Everything in column uh, 15, 16 is to be de determined. The Board of Education is, is um, in, in the process of uh, being presented with a staffing plan. At the end of the day, we will use this type of a format to calculate uh, FTE, full-time equivalency of staff in all of our um, categories of staff members, and then uh, calculate the value of the uh, retirements and resignations and replacements and additional or fewer positions. So I, I think we're probably dealing with additional positions, but this doesn't have any of that detail. It's just a format for future uh, for plugging in the numbers and, and when we present the final budget, we'll have something that, that, that renders this kind of detail as far as you know, how our, our staffing plan plays out with, in this perspective. So it's really just sharing how we're going to, at a future date, share that information with the board. On page nine, uh, I thought it was uh, a good idea since benefits is such an important part of our entire cost structure. Um, the uh, current plan for employees is in two categories, PPO and HMO. And uh, I can go, I can go, I can answer questions or we can go into this in some detail, but I think this is kind of a visually friendly format for understanding uh, all of the major components of our plan design, both in PPO and HMO, where they overlap, how they differ, and um, in these categories, um, for example, the deductible, the in-network coverage categories, the copay amounts, and prescription drug coverage. And these are categories that are going to be uh, reviewed during the collective bargaining process to uh, update some of the costs because some of the costs have not been updated and inflation does have an influence on some of the cost categories within your benefits plan design. On page 10 and then the subsequent pages in your handout, I'm sharing the, just to uh, make sure you're comfortable with the uh, formatting of, of the financial information that, that will be shared as we develop the 15-16 uh, budget, starting out with a, a composite by fund, which summarizes 14-15, showing the beginning fund balance, revenues, expenditures, and the balance of revenues and expenditures. And then that same format is on page 11 for 15-16. Uh, page 12. is right now uh, the budget in actual for 2014-15 is still not very different because the year is still developing. However, for example, in the property tax refunds and objections, we know that, that we're, we're probably going to come in just under 560000 or thereabouts on property tax uh, refunds and objections because of uh, the activity that we've experienced this year. It's, it's not really been a very good year as far as the accumulation of property tax refunds. And those are, I think I've shared that with the, with the board of the past, every time there's a distribution that comes from the county, we log that into a spreadsheet. We're tracking uh, by distribution date every uh, distribution of a refund. And uh, during the year, we'll probably have about say 40 or 50 lines in the spreadsheet, each line being a different date when distribution activities took place. And I think I've emphasized in the past that property tax refunds are not predictable. The, the Cook County system of, of, of granting the property tax refunds is, is a black hole of information. You cannot get anything out of it in terms of, of uh, information for planning. We're in a totally reactive mode. 
in that regard. And then you can see, you know, as I'm as I'm making some uh, fairly broad brush uh, estimates of how the 15-16 budget would play out. Um, right now, we're targeting for just under a million dollars of revenues, a balance of revenues minus expenditures. So 15-16 is looking good, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to be careful to monitor, monitor that longer term trend line. And Schedule 2 is, it, it focuses on non-operating funds. Schedule 3 combined for operating and non-operating funds. The non-operating funds are your debt, debt service and capital projects. And then each page beyond that is just each individual fund. And I, I won't get into, go into those. Those are, are provided because that's incorporated into your adopted budget document. And each one of those funds has its own um, identity financially for the district. Uh, the district is se segregates funds and, and its, its financial uh, operation into those funds per the Illinois Program Accounting Manual. So that's, I just thought it would be a, a good idea to give you some information at this point in time. Uh, uh, in my past experience, sometimes in April I'm further along. Uh, I think the park assessment uh, put us behind a little bit in terms of people being able to dedicate the necessary time to, to getting their budgets uh, finalized. We're still working through a lot of details. Uh, I, I think within the next uh, three weeks, uh, we'll be honing, uh, you know, account by account, uh, questions and answers about you know, why, why is this amount being proposed. I think the uh, principals and administrators that are developing the budgets here are, are very, you know, aware of, of how we've been discussing the comparison formula. Uh, we're, we're targeting uh, CPI-based. Um, examination of costs and uh, justification statements will be required for any increases that represent expansions of programs and therefore need to be discussed and examined in, in greater detail. Um, I think we are going to have some prioritization and cutting when it comes to uh, capital uh, requests, but that I'd actually be disappointed if we didn't because you know, it's important that people have their their ideas for new and replacement equipment and, and things that would benefit educational programs, but at the same time, we have to live within a certain pacing of, uh, of funding from year to year. What would be an example of capital equipment that wouldn't be IT and wouldn't be desks and wouldn't be building? IT, desks, building improvements, um, office equipment, copiers. Okay. Uh, we're we're bringing forward uh, something that will fall into capital outlay. A uh, request for a truck replacement. Uh, that's a piece of equipment. Um, so those those are the major major categories. Okay. okay. David, your um, the future financial projections seem to be a little bit more pessimistic than some of the ones we saw previously. Is there some factor that you're taking into account now that was different than maybe state funding issues or things that have changed since since Governor Rahner came in? Yeah, I, sh I, should, have, I should have covered that paragraph on the, on the first page, which, okay. which is, it, it is mentioning that there's publicity that the state of Illinois is preparing to cut the general state by 2.15% mandated categoricals by 2.25%, and then we have our lower than normal 0 0.8 tax gap CPI. Those, those three factors have been incorporated into our revenue projections, and when you, when you take a, a, a lower projection that had been previously anticipated and extrapolated out using more conservative growth factors, our revenue projections in general are, are not looking as favorable with this updated uh, draft, but I thought I would share the percentage increases from year to year in all these categories so you can see how I'm pushing out into the future uh, at, at a more conservative level with regard to revenue. It's, it was, I, I think the school district 
uh, lives and dies by the CPI. Right. You know, the CPI drives your access to pro local property tax, and local property tax is 85% of your revenue. So um, whatever happens to the CPI is what drives your, your revenue. And then um, uh, in, the, in, in the expenditure categories, I think that the areas that are most uncertain are, are cost and benefits because we don't control the, the, you know, the big picture of what medical costs are throughout the, the region and the nation. And then, of course, the school district, as I uh, explained earlier in an earlier draft, your uh, cost of outplacing special education students over the past 20 years has gone from almost nothing to uh, a high of $2.5 million. We're now down to you know, $1.6 million. And, uh, most recent conversation with, with Pamela Shaw is that we're looking pretty good for next year uh, based on the mix of students we have today. But that's an area where if the mix of students changes and, and we have uh, a, a growth in the numbers of students who have these uh, severe or profound uh, types of, of needs, then that cost category can take a jump. Dave, uh, you mentioned that we were at a high of two, two point five million, in, in um, some of the special ed costs. Um, outplaced what, tuition. Oh, that was outplaced tuition, and what year was that? Um, I think that was only three years ago. Okay. Um, let's see if I have that right here. Your. Um, Well, 2.378 million is is actual for 2013-14. Mm -hmm. um, I have to apologize. I thought that page three was going to be dollars, and it turned out to be percentages. Mm -hmm. That threw me off here. Well, that's the um, but yeah, it's, it's it's within the past couple of years. Okay. So for the 14-15 budget. There was a significant drop, and that could bounce back. So we have to we have to be aware that that is a cost category over which we have very limited control. Yeah. And uh, although I would you know I'd like to think that we could gravitate more toward an average over the past 20 years, school districts in in Illinois have seen the cost of outplacing students grow substantially at about an average inflation rate of six to seven percent. I guess you just answered you know, a question I would have asked. We, this, this drop hasn't had a whole lot to do with our great management of, of this expenditure. It has to do with, for the most part, for the mix of students. You know, I have to look at it. There's, there's efforts that have been made mm -hmm. by the administrative staff here. Um, if, if a student can be uh, provided services without being outplaced and administrative staff are aware that that is the preferred course of action and parents are accepting mm -hmm. yeah, and there's a process of, of uh, you know, the individualized educational program reviews will take place everybody comes to agreement that bringing the student back and, and not being an outplaced student that does save the school district money. All right. David, how do you explain the wild fluctuations of the state aid formula and, ca and formula and categorical? Page oh, I'm on page three. Okay. I think it's the first time I've seen it in percentages. I don't have a good answer right right now, but it looks like uh, in in 10 11 there was a 106 percent increase. Right, right. And uh, that's that could be in proportion to our increase in services to kids, because there's reimbursement 
when the expenditure side takes a boost mm -hmm. to to a lesser degree, a degree than than we'd like, but the revenue side does take a boost also. And and how do you explain the negative? The years that we have a number of years where it's negative. Prorations and reductions in, in the claim values. Okay. But I'm you know I'm glad you're looking at that because it does show that. You know, from year to year, there are fluctuations. Those are really student-driven fluctuations based on claims activity and services provided. Also, the state has been prorating special education. So, um, in fact, for, 20, for the current year, 2014-15, there was just a public um, an announcement that they're, they're cutting back what had been the proration. Maybe it was 98% uh, uh, funded, is now 96%. So we, I'll be watching how our state and federal categoricals come in, but the state categoricals are going to come in slightly less than the state told us they would be at the beginning of the year. Which is really not, not, not nice for them to change after Mid the year is almost right, that's over. That's what I was thinking. Uh, and, then, and then on top of that, they're cutting categoricals by 2.25% going into 2015-16. So um, we have to, I, I mean, I, I guess the only thing I can say is I'm glad it's not a 6% cut because 2.25% is probably something we can manage the school district even with that. Even with that cut, our revenues look, look pretty solid in comparison to our expenditures. I'm just a little concerned about how uh, the school district will look, you know, two or three years down the road, unless we're, we're able to um, you know, align the uh, align the expenditures with the revenues. And uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, you know, looking at those. But if we're if we're if we're just looking into the immediate future. The immediate future for 2015-16, as the budget is being developed right now, I think is, is, is pretty solid. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Uh, you pretty much stay right there as we get an update on the uh, uh, auditor selection process, uh, which again, the information was in our uh, board books as far as uh, the auditor's quoting and. Uh, it, it's uh, Monday that we are interviewing uh, the three auditing firms, correct? So. What was that? Uh, you Monday. Uh, You're interviewing three auditing firms? Then? Correct. Which ones? Um, they, it, it was uh, the three lowest, uh, I want to say, it was, wasn't it Miller Cooper? Uh, we have... I want to say Eder Warmer and, and I think it was Miller Cooper. Eder Casella. Eder Casella so, is the most economical right. at a five year cost of 124.085. If, if you want, I can pass this around. This was distributed in, in, in the board book. If anyone board needs board a board. copy, um, I do have extra copies if anyone wants one. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Eder Casella was the top in terms of ec uh, economically advantageous. Uh, Warmer Rogers and then Miller Cooper. Those are the three firms that the board team decided based on their uh, fairly strong uh, indicators as far as cost. And uh, they all three of them have very good reputations and a lot of, a lot of extensive background as, as auditors for school districts. David, I had a question for you uh, regarding uh, a couple of the auditors. Had, um, Optional services, additional services, one of them being Matheson said additional services in year one for conversion to GASB 34, OPEP, GSB 68. And the other one, um, Baker Tilly, had, was talking about required, implement required GSB reporting as of 6-30-2014. Is that something, an additional service that we would not be getting with the other auditors? Well, it, it, it is also there at, at, for Warmer Rogers, one of the top three. <coughs> um, right. But they all they all know that um, we've only done an accrual, a modified accrual for one year. 
I, 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 I answered many iterations of questions with, with these uh, firms, and I, I made sure to provide the answers to all their questions to all of the firms. So every, every time I got a question, everybody got the question and the answer, and uh, that, that reality is, is very well recognized by, by all the R&D firms. They, I think the, um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be that big of a, of a deal for them to go from where we developed our 13-14 audit mm -hmm. to R&D 14-15 because we, the, the, the major change was going to modify accrual, which we accomplished with FY 1314. Uh, they're going to have to produce some additional tables than they've, than they've done in, than, than has been done in the past. We'll be producing what is known as a management discussion and analysis section. But I think all of these firms, that's normal practice with all of their clients. Mm -hmm. or the, the majority of the clients. So we'll be fitting into templates and normal practices, and I don't, I don't think it's going to cost that much for them to do that. And what is it, we have one year left to make the full conversion to GASB? Well, um, I, I'm being optimistic. Uh, we've certainly made all efforts necessary to be GASB compliant with the 1415, our current year audit. Mm -hmm. Those components being going to modify accrual, getting uh, industrial appraisal to do a re-inventory of our building contents and, and land values, and uh, uh, having Donlin and Associates provide us with an actuarial study to provide an evaluation of our other post-employment benefits. Those are the components required. We have all of that in motion. We will have all of those pieces prepared. You know, it's still subject to the auditor uh, saying that everything is in order. But I, I'm anticipating that we should be GASB compliant. The, the, the threshold we're trying to cross is to have a, a non-adverse opinion. In the past, the, the, the district has had an adverse opinion, and we've been uh, reporting on a regulatory basis. So we're, we're basically going in the direction of best practices, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be matching uh, what the majority of school districts do, which is achieve that, that non-adverse uh, opinion and, and have GASB compliance. And then uh, can you comment on uh, the spirit of um, lowest responsible bidder, uh, meaning that these three auditing firms you mentioned are very reputable. It's not like they were doing full depth or strip paving and decided to go into the auditing business, correct? <laughs> um, you know, Ed, this, is, this is not subject to bidding. Uh, this is a professional services engagement. Um, if at the end of the uh, interviews with these three firms, the the board members and the team says, you know, we really don't like any of these three. You have no obligation to go with, with any firm other than what you're comfortable with. It's just like selecting a law firm. It's just like selecting um, an architect. You decide what firm is, is uh, that you're most comfortable with. So I think the, the, the team decided to interview three firms. My own uh, um, familiarity with their reputations you know, I, I'm very familiar with Miller Cooper and Wormer Rogers, and I'm familiar with school districts that have been very well served and are pleased with the Eater Casella's performance. But I think I think all three of them have, have strong credentials and background to present. Did they uh, did they quote the number of hours that they expected to attach to each of these audits? No. They did not. Um, are, are you afraid that they just lowballed it and then they come back and say, oh, I yeah, think 40. I think that's a big factor because if, you know, if the, if the, if Edder Casella is attributing 
you know, 150 man hours to this. And Wormer Rogers is, you know, attributing 60 man hours to this. That's a, that's an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm concerned about is is not getting an audit that's a gloss over or a dust off of a previous audit. But the whole reason we're going through this process right now is to get a fresh, in-depth look at this district's finances. Um, and I think ours is is an important piece of that. Okay, so um, Mayor Rose and I are on that, uh, we'll be there Monday, and so you think a good question to, to ask would be, you know, did, did you lowball us essentially that in so many words, would you yeah. say, what number of man hours did you use to calculate that? What was yeah. the assumption? What was the assumption? What was the assumption there? I, I think that's important for us to understand is what type of a team they're going to attach to this and how many hours they expect to attach to this. I suppose right. also the you would look at the the way that they describe their engagement, right? If they say they will provide X service <laughs> and they're willing to say they'll provide that service without the limitation on the hours, that's something you could consider, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to saying we will do an evaluation of this up to 10 hours. I mean, I, I've seen it done both ways, so certainly you're going to want to quiz them and, and see which way they've done it. Um, is there some way that they're able to sort of predict how much uh, time an in-depth audit would take? In other words, uh, it, would there be something different about the way we keep records than perhaps another school district that ours might take more time or less time? I, I, I guess how do, how do you make a good estimate of what's required? In terms of time? Well, every school district functions under the Illinois Program Accounting Manual. Every school district has the capability of, of download, downloading all of the transactions to their computer. Okay. What, what happens is that they, they say, okay, give us all your transactions, give us all your general ledger information. Um, it's, this is, you know, not a very, it's not a paper driven process anymore mm -hmm. as it used to be many years ago. So they'll be importing our data and then doing their analysis. And as they're importing it, we're in conformity with the Illinois Program Accounting Manual. And if, and if we're not, and they see some areas where the transactions are, are um, inappropriately posted to an account that is not the best uh, descriptor of the use of the money, then they will tell us that you know, it has to be over here. Okay. You know, it's a restatement. So, you know, ho hopefully our, you know, and, and that's that's what I think they're, they're, they're hedging a little bit. You know, they don't exactly know how solid our practices are in, in terms of conforming with the Illinois Program Accounting Manual mm -hmm. and being able to be imported and um, <coughs> to analyze the data as, as they're accustomed to do it. Um, I think the best indicator of, of, of whether or not they're they're doing a really good audit is is to is to ask them as we have for examples of audits and then and you, you read their audits and you can see you know, what kind of uh, kind of completeness they are providing in what we expect uh, as a as a published document. But I think one of the one of the things that boards of education struggle with is the is the reality that. Uh, uh, an, in, an independent audit done on an annual basis for a school district that meets GASB requirements and Illinois State Board of Education annual financial report requirements is of only a certain level of depth. Mm -hmm. And if the school district has areas of concern, they are, they are supposed to go through a, a question and answer. Uh, Interactions. They are supposed to send out a questionnaire to to board members, and and gauge any uh, area that they should look a little deeper into. If if they don't get much in terms of a response, and and nobody says, well, you know, here's an area that, that needs to be looked at, then they're going to you know adopt a pretty vanilla practice. So it's important that the board and administrators and, and staff members do interact with the auditor and and talk about any areas of concern and and uh, 
you know, make sure that everything is, is very visible. Um, if the board has a particular area with it of interest and it does become significantly involved in terms of additional hours, then they'll probably present a proposal and say, okay, if you want us to take every student activity transaction and you know reach a certain level of confidence about the cash handling involved, or your food services operation, all the cash handling involved with that, or you know uh, look at everything that had to do with um, the expenditures for a capital improvement program. If you want us to audit to a greater level of depth and, and, and report to the board that, you, that they've achieved that goal, that would be kind of a separate <coughs> engagement. And it would not be covered under, under this fee schedule. Mm -hmm. This fee schedule is, is basically to achieve GASB compliance and an Illinois State Board of Education annual financial report um, you know, standard of reporting. Can we ask that question in the interviews if we want to retain them for an additional assignment or some uh, further in-depth review of something? How much, what would the hourly charge be? Okay. We could ask that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am uh, for the, uh, this happening Monday afternoon, correct, David? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we bring this up uh, to today so we can give you an update on what's going on, but also to uh, let you know that of course, we're going to rely on David's expertise and questions to ask, but if there's questions, as Rich mentioned, or, or Rachel, that, that you have as far as, you know, how did they calculate the hours, we'll definitely ask that and the assumption. And then uh, to Rachel's point that uh, if we're going to retain them for additional services, you want to know what, what that fee would be or what the... What the hourly rate right. would be. Right. David, based on what you know of our past audits, um, are we in need of anything greater than than this Gaspy um, good question. Uh, audit that's uh, being requested? I haven't worked here enough days to really answer that question. <laughs> all that well, I, 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 nothing has jumped out to me except that there are certain. Um, expenditures that have taken place in the past that were not in conformity with the Illinois Program Accounting Manual. And so I've been working this year to do a couple of things. Uh, have those things correctly posted, create accounts uh, when needed. There was a couple of concerns that were brought up by the board uh, to track uh, food expenditures, uh, we're tracking software expenditures a little differently. Uh, we're careful in, in how we're charging things to capital outlay. There should be charged capital outlay rather than purchase services. So there are tweaks like that that I've been focusing on. Um, but no, I, I mean, I don't really have anything that I would say would uh, uh, give rise to the need for an agreed upon procedures audit, uh, which is the more you know, in-depth area of, of concern. This is. This is not a financially um, extensive operation. I mean, the dollars that are being uh, uh, transacted, for example, in your food services, is it, it's just it's not that big of a magnitude of, uh, of activity. Yeah. But some of the uh, issues that maybe in the past you uh, alluded to, uh, the things weren't put in the right categories and so forth. Some transactions, yeah. Yeah. Um, were they not picked up by the audit, uh, by the auditors? In many cases, yes, they were. They were? Yeah. They were picked and, up. And then they got restated and they got moved and, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want the auditors to have to do that. We should be doing it uh, along, you know, on an ongoing basis so the auditors don't have to do it. It's called reclassification. We don't want to have, have to have the auditors do reclassifications of expenditures. We want to have them properly classified uh, at the onset of, of the purchase order and the, the payment by check. And it's it's just a healthy practice to change auditors every uh, several years, few years. Is that uh, would you? I I think board members have have already you know seen that as a worthy expectation, and I think school districts do do that, and and that's why. 
these auditing firms know each other. They're, they compete with each other regularly because sometimes one auditing firm is, you know, leaves a school district and replaced by another, and they, they kind of play a musical chairs game to, to some degree. Uh, but you do want to deal with, deal with an auditing firm that knows school district auditing. So, uh, yeah, these, these, I know that these school districts, have, I mean, that these auditing firms have had a different mix of school districts that they're serving over the years because school districts want a fresh set of eyes, want to bring in a new auditing firm, and expect that auditing firm to, 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 to look at things from a new perspective. David, is it maybe um, a worthwhile um, to, you know, talk about, we've talked about how you get the standard audit, and then at, from time to time you may want to hire an auditor to look at certain things in more depth, um, such as food services or something or, or something else. Um, is there a value in sort of enumerating what some of these things might be and then maybe on a certain timetable look at, at some of these things? Uh, for example, to make sure that somebody is paid in compliance with a contract before they retire. Um, yeah, that I, would be an example. I've had a, you know, kind of a, uh, my own personal professional growth uh, goal would, would be to develop exactly what you're talking about. But I, I, to be honest, I don't think school districts do much of that. Uh, agreed upon procedures, uh, a greater extent than the vanilla. I don't, but I think school districts, after the fact, then say, well, we should have had that done, we should have had that done, we should have had that done uh, as an, an additional layer of, of auditing services. And, um, but, but to answer your question, no, I don't have that list. And that would be a very good uh, question during our interviews of the auditing firms. You know, what engagement of your services have you ex uh, had experience with where school districts say, let's uh, peel back the layers of the onion in this particular direction or facet or aspect of our financial operations? And then, uh, and then what was the outcome of your uh, additional services engagement? Do you feel like the school district was satisfied with the additional services that you provide? And, and maybe you wouldn't do it every year, uh, but maybe certain things you would look at on a cycle every five years or, right. or certain triggers. I would make sure that our, that our investments are all in compliance with the Illinois, Program, uh, uh, Illinois Public Funds Investment Act. And make sure that uh, our cash handling and food services is all exactly what the auditor would expect it to be. Uh, employment contracts is an area where they could they could do a, a more detailed examination. Uh, compliance with uh, IMRF and you know doing some kind of advanced legwork to make sure that the next time we get audited by uh, a state agency that they've already helped us. Mm -hmm. you know, monitor and make sure that we will be in compliance. Those are the kinds of things that an already firm should be able to help you out with. Okay. And another question, unless Michael, um, ask them if they rotate their audit team supervisors <clears throat> year to year. Good question. Okay. Anything else from anybody? We move on. Uh, thank you, David. I, I, we do have the IMET update. Um, the, the, to you again, or if you wanted to take a break, we can maybe go to the <laughs> staffing plan. It's, it's up to you. you know, I, I can cover this, I think, fairly quickly. The, the uh, promise from the Proviso Township Treasurer's Office was that they would provide us with monthly uh, updates. Uh, those monthly updates have been occurring. I've shared with you an update that was, uh, I'd say, of some greater significance because there's some optimism built into this update where the sale of five hotels um, may result in 60 per to 70 percent of the total loss uh, being recovered. Um, I think at this point the only thing we can conclude is that maybe there's a reason to be 
skeptically optimistic. <laughs> um, but that's about it. You know, there's still a lot to be, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, and we still have to, at some point in time, if there is a loss, um, you know, we'll, we'll assert a model of sharing a loss among all the school districts that is fair and equitable. And I'm an advocate for that being based upon how we cost share the, the cost of the office's uh, operating expenses on, on an annual basis. And I've certainly made that point very clear with the, with the Proviso Township Treasurer's Office. At this point, you know, being skeptically optimistic is, seems to be warranted, but um, uh, I, I think I should report back to you maybe not every month, but every other month for sure, so that you're, you're, you're well apprised of how this is, is uh, developing. But as we've discussed, closure on this matter is two years away, I would, I would anticipate, maybe even a couple years longer than two years. All right, we'll move off the IMET uh, thing and cover our last item uh, on the uh, agenda before we get into announcements and future meeting dates is the 2015-16 uh, uh, staffing plan. I'm going to ask that um, Dr. Gannon um, present the staffing plan. He and I and uh, Mrs. Uh, Shaw and Mr. Tafano worked with principals both together and independently on coming up with this based on need. So, um, Brian, are you going to have, is each, depart, uh, is each director going to present their? Yeah, I've, um, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and start by just kind of describing the format of the plan. Okay. And then we'll turn it over. Um, it should be in the board book, but I do have copies if anybody would like them. I'll take a copy. Really important to look at this in color because I think it's the only way it might make sense. Um, okay. Okay, so um, the, the plan itself, the, the first page is a description of the positions um, that we know are going to be open in our school district. They're not all necessarily positions that need to be filled, or well, they're not positions that need to be filled by additional FTE, just the ones in green are. Um, the one position that um, is not on here, um, and Mr. Drack and I were just talking about this, um, is a student support coordinator at Hauser. Um, and um, I wasn't exactly sure when that uh, resignation letter was coming to the board, but it sounds like it's been to the board already, so that would be another position um, that would be out there. Um, so anything that's highlighted in green are additional FTEs that we're looking for um, for next school year. And then if you look at, for example, um, about halfway down, you'll see a Blythe, Blythe Park district-wide. Um, and you'll see that it's not in green, but there's a 0 0.6 that is in green. Um, that is because we're, we're changing, we're, we're asking to change what that position looks like. The 0.4 FTE speech position already exists, but the person that was in that position moved out of state. And we're hoping to combine that with the behavior specialist that Pam Trump will talk a little bit more about um, in a few minutes. Um, the next page on the format, or on the document, is a summary. Um, and basically, in, in red, or it actually came out in pink, um, where, where you'll see the name of the school there, um, those are positions that we no longer need. Um, and then in green, again, are the additional FTEs for a total of 3.6 certified, 2.0 non-certified, and 3.0 classified. So, um, we're not looking at the amount of staff that we need we need last year, and we hope that that's, that's a trend. Um, any questions on the format before we each kind of go over the positions themselves? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, Don, I'm going to have you start with the tech department then. Uh, within the, uh, the tech department, um, as far as the, uh, the positions, um, to be um, added slash maintained uh, are the, uh, the two, two uh, full-time technicians, which um, we currently uh, do have two technicians on staff. They've just been through a consulting firm, whether it's Robert Half or Addison Group. Um, when you really look at the number of 
devices that we have. We have close to 2,000 computing devices within the district that have to be uh, maintained, upgraded. Uh, staff are very dependent on not only, staff and students are very dependent on those devices. Uh, we not only have the computing devices, but in every classroom we have projectors, we have document cameras, we have phones, we have control mechanisms that control the projector and document camera. Uh, we have a lot of points of failure. There's also, uh, well, there's a high dependency on those items, uh, and there's also, um, uh, in terms of service levels, there's an expectation in terms of the, the turnaround uh, when something is broken, that it be fixed, uh, any, any types of repairs. We also have printers uh, and uh, copiers that, that are, are, are maintained as well. So from a, a sheer device level and maintaining that, um, uh, the, uh, the technicians are a, cri a critical part of just keeping the district running. When you also take to, into consideration that uh, we, we've accomplished a lot, but we still have a lot to accomplish still. There's a lot of additional uh, resources and systems that are, could, will, that will likely be proposed to be put into place. Again, additional, additional points of failure um, in the future. Um, <clears throat> From uh, an administrative support, uh, the, uh, the, the full-time administrative support is really ha half-time administrative support uh, uh, to assist with just day-to-day -day, uh, department administration uh, and then also um, project management in, in that, there, you know, vendor coordination, meeting coord you know, coordination of, of, of that, uh, but then also, uh, also half-time uh, student information support. Um, we have, uh, we, we really don't have one dedicated person. Uh, many of those responsibilities are, are, are split up and shared. Uh, we do have an individual in the district office that does manage the student side. And there's also the staff side and the state reporting side that happens with uh, the SIS. Uh, many districts have, well, most districts have at least a half or a full time person uh, just really focused on that SIS student information system uh, administration. Uh, having appropriate staff uh, also allows us to do cross-training. Uh, in, in an environment like ours, uh, we don't require a, um, a lot of high-level technical uh, individuals to, to be staffed, but what you also do is you, you, you also have uh, individuals that are developing skills and then moving on. Uh, so um, uh, W with any of these individuals, especially technicians, you do see a turnover. I typically have seen turnover on technicians at about every year and a half to two years, just given that the pay scale within the environment will cap, their skills progress, and they, they move on to, to different uh, um, in, in environments. Um, uh, and, and that's just a general summary of, of, of the needs, uh, and if you have any questions. Down on the two technicians, uh, bringing those two staff members in-house, are you realizing any net savings by not paying a subcontractor to supply those? Um, I, I'd have to really look at the, um, uh, in terms of you know benefits and so what the, what the total cost would be. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's been costly to use the uh, the, the uh, contracted services. It, right. it, is, it, is, it is taking a big chunk out of our uh, purchase services uh, budget. More than we the, the, the definitely were anticipating. I wasn't anticipating having you know staff coming out of a, a purchase services account, uh, but could definitely you know work on work on those formulas to see what what a salary range and with benefits uh, would uh, would equate in terms of what we're doing through purchase services. I think the other thing with with the staff is that uh, the the people that we've had we've had. We've had mixed experiences with uh, with the staff that that have, have come in, and that's always a um, uh, that's always a risk. Um, the um, the other thing is that the the staff do work extremely hard, uh, and uh, in terms of having individuals that um, have ownership of the work that they're doing. Uh, but that also know if they if they get sick, if they need to take a, a, a vacation, that they have uh, some some benefits that go along with with that as well. And uh, in in the current environment, they 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 don't. So you run uh, you know higher risk of you know, well, there's a, you know potential burnout and so forth. And 
with the just the contracted staff that are you know if they they only get paid if they if they work the day if they're if they're sick or you know work that they don't have any benefits associated with that. And this is through what firm are we getting our contracted mm -hmm. staff? This is all Robert Half or one through Robert Half and one through Addison Group. So, John, if if you hadn't done an analysis comparatively mm -hmm. uh, based on what you would be saving going out house versus in us, what um, how was the decision made? What was the basis mm -hmm. for the decision to switch from using outsourced people to, to in house? I, I think given given the experience that I've had with with outsourced staff versus uh, uh, versus the the, the um, employees the, my 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 experience um, this is the first environment that I've had full time outsourced staff uh, but uh, but again I can definitely <clears throat> come back with additional information on on a comparative do dollars comparative comparison. Oh, cool. In addition to the financial side of it, uh, how about uh, the quality of the uh, employee? Maybe um, I, I, I'm thinking about the uh, the bad experience that we had this this past year, the issue of background checks, uh, having bringing that in house. Is there more control? Is it uh, preferred? Would you? Uh, um, you know, I'm again. I'm going off of my my experience. Uh, yeah, it it has been a very mixed bag with the, the contracted staff. I don't want to 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 knock the work that that they've done, but um, there's uh, I think having um, uh, going through the hiring process. Uh, uh, I, I think you you do have when you're hiring people that have. Uh, longer stints of success uh, coming from other um, employers, and uh, you're able to get a little bit more information on, on background and, and the successes that they've had. It's, I think that definitely does have a benefit. Can you tell me how big is the, the tech department going to be with this, these additional positions? It, we, it would be <clears throat> um, a total, well, we have two instructional uh, individuals, mm -hmm. um, then we have the uh, technology services manager, and it would be the two technicians underneath that individual. And then uh, with the administrative uh, position, uh, that would be the, the sum. Would we still be outsourcing any of the positions if we added these positions? No. OK. So just kind of to go over what you just said, you've got yourself, you've got the tech, technology services manager. Is that the correct title? And he's correct. And that person is primarily the network person. Current network and, and managing all the services, and then also overseeing uh, overseeing the technicians. Direct report to the technicians. Okay, and so the, when you talk technicians, these would be the two people. Correct. And then you've got two um, support. What were they? Support specialists. In, instructional. Yes. Instructional Instru support. In, correct. And those are more. Are those certified? Correct. And then those are on the, the classroom side. Uh, the instructional side, so assisting with the implementation and training of uh, staff. And uh, and then the administrative specialist, which is in the next line on the... All right. Correct. That would be One, administrative two. support, but then also um, uh, student information system, data data system support as well. And so uh, are we, we're talking seven people. Is that what I just counted up? Uh, with yourself? Correct. <clears throat> that would be correct. And that's going, okay, from from currently four to seven. Good, good full time. Yes. <clears throat> okay. But where, how many do you have right now that are temporary staff? We have two temporary, oh, two temporary staff. Exa four. Exactly. So, so we're at, so we're at, at technically six, we're at six. six. So we're at seven with, the, I would say, the increase of the administrative support. Exactly. That's pretty much what we're adding because right. we're switching out two technicians for from out how, from outsourcing to making them district employees. That's what we're requesting with the addition of one administrative support staff. Okay, so that's a okay. An but, increase of one. Okay. I'd like to see if we can a cost benefit analysis of what the cost difference is going to be sure. by employing them versus doing the um, outsourcing. Okay, definitely. Thank you. And just for review, what is the difference between classified and certified staff? 
Well, the, the certified staff have come from an educational background. Uh, they are there. You know, um, one of the certified staff that we have is, is on the uh, is, is on the teacher's uh, contract. Uh, one is not. Okay. I think if I could, I think I might know where that question is going as well. Um, we have on this one, we have 12 month classified, and then we have certified and non certified. Right. The non certified are, are um, work more in our paraprofessional roles. They're 10 month employees and part of the REC. The 12 month classified employees are 12 month employees. Um, they're not part of the REC. Uh, uh. But they're, uh, they're almost like, like our district office staff downstairs are non certified employees. Okay. Thank you. Or 12 month classified employees. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Up oh, too high. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to kind of go through most of the other positions, um, uh, and I don't want to read too much on the position no longer needed, um, but I will answer questions on that, and, and that is partly because. Um, like, I mean, first and foremost, um, anybody who wasn't going to be with us next year has already been, been told. So there's no, you know, everybody will have a job that, that is have a job, but there may be some minor internal shiftings, and we haven't had those conversations with staff yet because we want to make sure we have board approval before we, we, we do that. So, um, but, it, but some of them are, um, you know, a little bit easier. For example, um, if you look at the Ames position, um, we're going to need a fifth grade. We have an extra fifth grade section at Ames next year. Um, that's a wash um, because we're down one fifth grade section at Blythe. So that's why that's not green. That's a wash. Um, we're not talking people, though, like teachers necessarily. Like We're not saying that that fifth grade teacher is going to move to Ames. We're just saying that spot is open because that position is uh, no longer needed. Um, the next, um, looking at Ames' um, numbers in special education, they're going to need um, a 0 0.5, an additional 0 0.5 resource teacher. Um, but we are going to be able to make some adjustments, as you can see, um, in the last column on positions no longer needed, we'll be able to cover that FTE without having to actually add FTE. Um, I'm going to, the Blythe Park and District Wide, I'm going to um, have Pam talk about in a minute. Um, <laughs> that's assuming I'm going to be done in a minute, but you know me. <laughs> the, uh, the central position, again, first grade teacher. Um, we need a first grade uh, teacher at Central due to retirement, but we, um, are losing a, a fourth grade section at, at Central. So again, that's a wash um, as far as FTE. Um, the Hauser one is um, kind of an interesting one. But um, Steve and I have been working together um, on if, and again, this is pending the Hauser schedule as well. There's a couple of these that are um, pending the Hauser schedule. But um, if we are able to block math for 80 minutes, technically we would need four new math teachers because you're adding all those sections of math. However, um, after really carefully looking at the, the staff um, and looking at some of the resignations um, that have happened over the past month, um, we are able to cover what those four positions by only adding two FTE for math. Um, so if we add two full-time math teachers at Hauser um, with the resignations and looking at people's certifications already and being able to shift some staff around, we are going to only need two new FTEs to, do, to make that happen instead of four. Um, I don't quite follow the math there. Um, how can you um, how can you do that? Uh, I mean, you're moving teachers from one a subject matter to another. In in some cases, yes. For example, if a teacher is certified to teach social studies, which a lot of our middle school teachers are, they may pick up a section of social studies. Um, and so, um, and also, um, there's we need one section less of ELA next year. So instead of replacing that, we're going to replace that with math. Um, and uh, we need one section less of PE and health next year. Um, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to replace that. Um, we, has a, we have a, um, an opening, but we're not going to replace it. Instead, we're going to hire a math teacher. And we're going to be able to cover all of those other classes. Brian, why do you need one section <coughs> less of ELA? What drives that? Numbers. OK. Um, and this is, again, at, at Hauser, right? This is at Hauser, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, ELA is still. This is why I don't like these things. Um, ELA is still staying at um, 80 minutes, but um, based oh. based on numbers and teacher certifications, on who's certified to teach ELA, okay. um, we're able to to use staff differently internally. Okay. Um, to cover that, and and that's always been a goal of ours is to really take a look at what our staff um, 
not only what they're certified to teach, but obviously we want to get you know high what they're comfortable teaching and what they're um, you know how they qualified to teach, and then maybe use them in different ways to meet our kids' needs. And I think that's something we should look at every year. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the next one in green is two paraprofessionals for the early learners program um, at Hollywood. Um, as that program is growing, which um, it's I think it's almost full for next year already. Um, we are um, in need of two additional paraprofessionals, and we're really hoping to, to hire two paraprofessionals that um, have preschool experience, that want to work with preschool students, that know what it entails you know, <laughs> to work with preschool students, because it, it, it is a different type of, of position. Um, I, know I, I think it would be a blast, but everybody would agree with me. So we're, we're, kinda, you know, we're really hoping to find the people that are really looking for that position. We think, I think it makes a big difference um, as well. And, and that's in addition to the paraprofessionals that we already have in the preschool. Um, the two reading specialists, I'd be honest, I wasn't sure what to do with this number, if it should be green, and if it should be white. Um, it, it, it's in white because we currently have the two additional reading specialists. Um, and I, originally, you know, the approval was for um, a you know, certified teaching position. Um, we, we changed that. We had the subs in there, and, and I think that's worked out you know, well for the end of the school year. Um, but because they've already been approved at one point, I didn't put them in green. And also, I'm not sure right now if we're going to need to or not, because I really want to look at our spring data, our chai data, and take a look and see kind of where we're at um, with that. You know, we should see our numbers going down. So I kind of left that in, in white as a position um, that's out there. But we're not quite sure what that's going to look like right now until we uh, finish our map testing in the spring. I think it's a little too premature to say right now that we definitely need to. And when does that data come out? So we should be able, we should have it back by, I would say, the third week in May, where we're able to you know, have a solid idea of all of our benchmark assessments are done. Okay. So, Brian, um, those are the RTI positions that we approved yes. back in December, and we hired them in February. Yeah, we hired them as, as long-time sub-positions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that you have some doubt as to whether we're going to need two of those in the future? I think my, my hesitation is more to say that I, I'm not comfortable with saying that we definitely need them until I see the progress the kids have made. Yeah. You know, um, I, I mean, I, th I think that there is a good chance that we're going to need them because we're still trying to play catch up as the RTI scores increase. But until we really see the scores and have a chance to, to analyze yeah. them, um, I, I, I think it makes the most sense to keep that on our radar. Because yeah. it's still yeah. early enough in May to post those positions. It, it seemed to me when we filled approve those two positions that um, the need may have been greater than than for those two positions that we approved to mm -hmm. um, what we want to do is we we want to um, uh, you know fund and provide the number of positions that the students need absolutely and not um, perhaps what uh, Maybe some of my other board members want to hear. Um, okay, so yeah. I, I guess that's where I, I, I pose the question to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I appreciate that and I respect that. Um, my personal recommendation is still, I, I, until we see the progress our students made with, I mean, we, we did have these two new RTI reading specialists. Um, if I had to predict, I would say that we probably do still need two positions, but. And until I can see that data, I, I, I don't want to ask for positions that I'm not 100% sure we're going to need. Originally, we asked for one additional reading specialist. We were able to get two, which was phenomenal. We got that extra support this year. Um, that was great. Um, I'm assuming we're going to need that support next year. But I think it's a little premature for me to say that we need two for sure until I have a chance to look at the data. Um, you know, and, and again, that is a position that hopefully as time goes on, you know, we need less and less of it. Maybe too early to to make that prediction now that we will need less. But I think it's I, I think it's the right thing to do. Sure. Uh, talking about um, one thing that's not on here is the RTI math. I, I see that we're not adding any RTI math positions. Are are you are you not recommending uh, that we need any additional to meet the uh, requirements of our students? Well, I think 
So right now, based on our elementary RTI data, um, again, we have to wait for the spring data, um, the students are making great progress. Um, within the middle school, these two math FTEs that we're adding will be able to support RTI as well. So, I mean, in, in a sense, th these are 2.0 math teachers at the middle school, um, which is going to shift some, some RTI roles as well. So we are adding RTI roles in the middle school. Um, at the elementary, right now, you know, again, um, I'd love to come back here and at the end of May and talk, but right now our kids are making really good progress. Um, we've done a, okay. I mean, those, those, how that are group has done a great job. And how are you measuring that, the progress? Um, through um, several, we have we have formative and we have benchmark assessments, but the spring benchmark assessments um, are our AIMS web assessments our, and our uh, math assessments. Okay. Um, and then we have assessments within the curriculum, the sync solution assessments, and other assessments that we're using. Well, um, so all kinds of assessments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've, <laughs> we've, we've seen some great things so far. So, you know, again, it's, we're hoping that it, it keeps up. You know, we're expecting it to, but you never know. Yeah. Um, Okay. But that was a good question, though, because it, technically in the, at Hauser we are adding. We're, we're adding four full-time We're going to have uh, uh, math, math teachers. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yep. some of those will be able to uh, to assist with the RTI. It'll either be some of those or it'll be some current teachers that will pick up additional RTIs. We're not sure what it will look like yet, but there will be additional RTI supports. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and then the, the last one, um, before I turn it over to Pam, um, is um, again, this is pending the, the schedule at Hauser, but if we do move band and orchestra into the, the school day, which has been discussed, um, then what we're going to need is um, an additional uh, to keep the fifth grade program going. If we you know decide that that's what we want to do, um, which is a great program, um, we would need a halftime band teacher and then a halftime orchestra teacher. The complication with this position is. Um, First of all, it might be hard to fill, I'm not quite sure. Um, but the other complication is uh, it can't be a 1.0 position because band and orchestra students are pulled out of during music instruction, typically. And so the band and orchestra teachers are there together. Um, so it's less in, um, in intrusive to the to learning environment. Um, so we're not pulling them out of like ELA, we're not pulling out of math, we're not pulling them out of science, we're pulling, you know, they're, they're getting pulled out of music class. So um, that, this is only needed if we do end up, you know, with the new Hauser schedule, putting band orchestra into the school day because those teachers now that are Hauser that typically go to the elementary will not be able to do that anymore because their days will be packed. Yeah. So are they, are, are those teachers, uh, how are they paid for that time at the elementaries? Is that through a stipend or? Uh... Right now it's part of their, their day. It's um, just part of their day yeah okay uh, but the stipend sometimes is like the band in the morning you know like they they they'll have kind of an extension of their day by having morning band or something and so but they do that so they can fit the fifth grade in yeah. during the school day so if, if we would hire 0.5 and 0.5 would we be saving in some of the stipends I would I would imagine yes but I, I'd have to take a better look at that um, it's a very I mean it would that's that's what occur, would occur to me that you would. Uh, and I think by moving um, band into the school day, that, that that might occur as well. That might what as well? Uh, we might save on some stipends. Okay. Um, now this is an additional. How many again current band teachers and orchestra teachers do we have? So right now we have two band teachers and one orchestra teacher. Okay. Um, and that's really you know, based on the historic numbers of our kids, we typically have double the kids in band in an orchestra. Okay, and, all right. And this need is created because we're moving this these particular classes inside the school day versus before. Right, so our band and orchestra teachers won't have the availability to drive over to the elementary schools okay. to support the program at fifth grade. Okay. All right. All right, and then uh, Pam, there's just one more, I guess, point six position, right? Right, right. Um, the other position that we're looking at would be a point five or point six autism slash behavior consultant for the district. Um, we're looking to put this position into place in order to be more proactive in supporting our students' needs and having someone who can be able to be on hand 
uh, more consistently to be able to go into the classrooms and model with the paraprofessionals and the certified staff as well too, different ways to help support the students, be able to do ob observational data, and then make um, decisions based on what a child would need to have in place. Um, we're looking at someone who also can provide strong professional development um, to staff, not only hands-on modeling for them in the classroom, but also possibly some work after school to, to help support our paraprofessionals as well as our certified staff. I know the paraprofessionals have um, been greatly appreciative of the uh, professional development that they've had this year. That's something that we would like to continue. It's critical that we help our paraprofessionals and our certified staff as well too learn how to work with our students and provide them the support but with also helping students to increase their independence as that is always the goal for students to be as independent as possible. Um, executive functioning is a ongoing area that we need to help and support our students in, especially students um, who are high functioning on the autism spectrum, they need those supports, as well as some behavior and communication strategies. I know it may seem odd that you have a speech pathologist um, paired with a um, autism consultant specialist, behavior specialist, but often um, in programs with even students who have significant needs of autism, a speech pathologist is very much part of the program as communication is such a huge component of um, students on the autism spectrum. And that pragmatic language is a huge piece that we have to help students work through and understand. And typically, um, often, I shouldn't say typically, but often there are very many um, speech pathologists who are also well versed in this area of autism and behavior consultants for students with autism. So that's what we're looking to do and to be more proactive and really provide that hands-on training for staff, modeling, um, giving insight of how to support our students best. That's what we're looking for. Any questions? So that would be the Ames and the Blythe point five special it, No, no, it would be the point six, and it says Blythe um, slash district because it would be paired with a point four speech pathologist position. Point six. It's, a, it's, it's on the, the second page, page I believe. In the middle of the page. Okay. All right. Well, special sure. education resource. Mm -hmm. So along with the, the point six autism behavior specialist district wide is in green because that would be the additional right. cost. Oh and those other two special ed positions um, are going to be wash. Yeah, we're going to be able to cover that. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank you. the uh, game plan is: Will this be presented for us for put it at the next, uh, the April twenty-first board meeting? We'll present those cost analysis that were requested with the technology, um, and then I believe also with the band and orchestra with stipends, and then uh, have that for you to take action at the uh, April twenty-first board meeting. Very good. Um, our final item is just an uh, uh, announcement. Uh, oh, one more uh, thing. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Um, um, for the attachment, excuse me, the second attachment for the staffing plan is um, Mr. Duraka has uh, a proposal. That's right. Sorry. Proposal. That's okay. My fault. Um, a proposal for um, department chairs um, at the middle school. So he is going to um, share with you what our proposal is, um, or what his proposal is for um, Hauser. And we've discussed it as an administrative team and um, support the idea, and we wanted to bring it to you. Um, for review. Thank you. Yeah, really for the purpose of, um, of best practice and trying to build leadership capacity um, and provide some organizational structure for Hauser Junior High School in the area of curriculum and instruction, I wanted to propose uh, department chair positions as they relate to social studies, math, science, ELA, and special ed. Um, within that, I, uh, with my friends and colleagues from the uh, Suburban Consortium for Academic Excellence, which are some of the schools listed here, I asked them uh, if they had department chairs in both of the middle schools that I've worked in in my uh, past experience as an administrator. We've had 
uh, department chairs or instructional coaches. Uh, stipends in those uh, organizations have ranged anywhere from 1700 to 4500 and the purpose of the position would be a uh, stipend position, but really for the development and alignment of curriculum for the Common Core State Standards. And as we approach the Common Core State Standards, uh, they will be ever-changing. Um, they may be in place as one format this year, but uh, the idea is that the Common Core State Standards should regularly adjust to meet you know, the changing needs of, of our society and our kids. Um, the department chairs would work with me on the development of a master schedule and teaching assignments and appropriate roles. Um, resource allocation and requisition. Um, department chairs would work on ordering and managing instructional materials such as textbooks, workbook, workbooks, consumables. Um, department chairs would be involved in the professional development, assessment, resource procurement, methodology, and best practices. Um, in addition, we have looked at the idea of creating district level assessments and um, the development of those would also work through the department chairs. Um, additionally, I would hope that department chairs would be able to work with Riverside Brookfield High School in terms of vertical articulation um, and developing curricula that aligns with them as well and also uh, providing professional development in the area of common core state standards and best practices. And then lastly, I'm really working with the principal to develop a curriculum and instruction leadership team that uh, is really our economic engine. I mean, we're in the business of creating great learning experiences and it would be um, beneficial, again, organizationally speaking and uh, curricularly speaking to have um, a group of professional educators uh, that helps in that structure to continue that that process for Hauser uh, as a, uh, in total. So that's the uh, you know the general uh, gist, gist of the proposal. How are you, Rick? Uh, how would you track? I see you've got them down here for uh, based on a per hourly. You are basing it on it looks like certain number of hours, are these teachers going to be, are you proposing that they track and like have a timesheet for all the work that they do or that this would just be, if you're the department chair then you're going to be getting an additional stipend and you're going to do, you're not going to be tracking your hours? Well, my, the idea is that I don't want this to be an hourly position. Right. I want it to be a stipend position that relates to uh, the work that needs to be done. and. Um, you know, the, that work may, may adjust maybe during times of assessments or uh, curricular development or assessment development. Those hours might be higher and then in other areas that may be, may be lower. Um, I would not think of this as a time sheeted position, but I would also say that uh, this group of individuals would meet with me regularly, uh, at least twice a month, for the, um, for the updates, development, planning, implementation of all of the things that are mentioned here. Uh, as it sits right now as the principal, other than Mrs. West and I have approximately 60 direct reports to me. And so that's, uh, organiz organizationally speaking, that's pretty considerable. And when you talk about having to manage the science department and all of its resources and pilot math and then social studies and special ed, which is, is very dynamic and demanding, especially when you take a look at moving forward in terms of assessment and how much energy and time that takes uh, with the park assessments and map assessments on a regular basis and then implementing um, you know, Ames Web for, for progress monitoring. It becomes quite, quite a large and dynamic task to have uh, all of those, those pieces in place. So I think, again, from my past practice, this is something that's really beneficial for the overall instructional program. Um, again, like I, like I said before, it's sort of the economic engine that drives this business, to have a group of people that, that is that core group of people that's focused on curriculum, instruction, and assessment at the, uh, at the middle school level. So I, I would guess that you would select probably your your 
your best or promising, most promising uh, uh, teacher to be your department chair? Absolutely. I think um, what, what you're going to want to look for in a, um, in a department chair is somebody who is going to be a leader in my building, uh, somebody who's going to uh, build relationships with their staff because they have to work collectively with those individuals to develop curriculum. But then also, you want to make sure that they're at the top of their game in the classroom as well so that they can share their practices with, with other people. So certainly I'd want to uh, put the, um, the best and the brightest, so to speak, on that team so that they can help uh, propel the organization forward. Steve, um, how many are you proposing of, of uh, the stipend um, uh, department chair position? Yeah, at the top there, I just listed the, the main core areas, just math, social studies, science, ELA, and then special ed. Two, three, four, five. Uh, so that would be a total of five. I just wanted to point out, I don't think this is a, I think it's a good idea, but because it's a stipend and we're negotiating, it's probably something we have to discuss in our negotiations. Sure, sure, and, and I recognize that. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I guess this was the opportune time to, to bring it up. And yes, it was. To, um, and we followed up with uh, Shelly about this and uh, asked her, shared the idea, and um, her suggestion was to present it at a board level see if there was buy-in um, for the transition of um, if and when that this can be negotiated. Um, if this is something that the board is supporting, we can talk with um, the union leadership, see if they're supportive of it. We can put together a memo of understanding until a contract is negotiated, and then this would be negotiated into the contract. We can just add it into our process right now. It's very timely right yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. We need to take an extra step. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Steve, just a quick question. What would be the difference between a stipend department chair or uh, or something I've heard called a teacher leader? Well, you are... know what? I think sometimes we use, we use those um, those terms. Um, they, they parallel one another, basically. Uh, it's, it's really semantics, to be quite honest. Um, and, and both of which are focused on curriculum and instruction, teaching and learning and using assessment data to, to drive your instructional practices. And is a teach, let's say a teacher leader, uh, are these types of positions always um, recognized or compensated through a stipend? You know what, there's, there's, uh, there's variations in the way that uh, department chairs and teacher leaders are um, compensated. Sometimes they're compensated not in the form of stipend, but in the form of uh, release time from class. So instead of giving them a stipend, they would be removed from, let's say, one or two classes, and they would have that time within the day. Um, but I don't know if that would be quite honestly economically advantageous to us, especially if you consider that as a, let's say it's just a five people, two class periods, that's an FTE, which is $45,000, whereas this is... 25. You got it. Yeah, you it, know. it would equal one more staff member. Yeah, and so I, I think this is economically advantageous for for the work that I think what we'll, what we would want to do at the middle school level. At the high school level, that might look a little different. But. So, Steve, you you would see uh, these department heads uh, essentially functioning this service um, in addition to their. Absolutely. The, the regular day. Correct. And so. that's why I did not want to have it to be an hourly position mm -hmm. because I want it to be a, a role that you play rather than, okay, I've done my two hours. I want it to be a role that's played um, for, for, that, for that position. So they would have their regular teaching load with their appropriate number of plan mm -hmm. periods and so on and so forth, um, but then this would be an additional responsibility. I would support this as a stipend with the assumption that the teacher is going to have the regular class load, so that teacher uh, theoretically is going to be doing this planning before they get to work mm -hmm. or, after. or after they leave yeah. work. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that, in my mind, supports a stipend at that point. That mm -hmm. is correct, and I agree yeah. It's not like the department head at uh, university I went to that uh, maybe taught one class. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think that's the direction we're looking to go at the middle school. No, we're really just trying to create some organizational structure and some leadership capacity here at Housing. Good. 
I have one more question. I, I think it's a really great structure, the way you laid this out. I'm just, um, I don't, I guess I don't understand how the assistant principal fits into this, if at all. Sure. Well, I, as the principal, <coughs> I consider myself the instructional leader of the building. That's my mm -hmm. primary responsibility here. Uh, these individuals would uh, be directly related to me. The, um, and work directly with me. The assistant principal, however, is um, aligned with uh, student management, communications, activities, um, building and operations, and those pieces. And so again, she's also one of my direct reports, okay. um, and so I work with her on, on those things as well. Okay, thank you. Would these um, stipend positions um, get more actively involved in evaluations? They are not type 75 positions, so they would not necessarily be involved in evaluating teachers. So you still... But they could be involved in the coaching of teachers in terms of best practice. Yeah, and, and I think, I think we don't want to keep that separate. Um, I mean, first of all, they, they're not working under a type 75, so they couldn't evaluate. But also, um, it's, it's a team leadership role, too, so you want to make sure that you have that that support and that, that trust and that camaraderie amongst teams so that the teammates don't see this person as somebody that, that kind of has a, a leg up on the evaluation of, of each other. Okay, but so, so you still got 60, how many direct reports did you say? Approximately 60. All right, for evaluation purposes. Mm -hmm. Stacy and I share uh, 50 teachers and uh, 10 paraprofessionals uh, and then also three secretary positions. Okay. Two, two secretarial positions, including the librarian. So this will just be added on to summarize, Rich, um, yep. um, onto your negotiations, conversations, and then yep. keep this posted as far as for next year. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, final thing, uh, uh, announcement purpose is only a uh, summer school uh, uh, announcement. Remember that this is a finance meeting and uh, that we will not be taking questions or, or uh, issues on summer school. In the interest of time, I promise to be quick. I just wanted to give you guys a timeline for what's happening uh, with summer school. Um, tomorrow morning, we will be launching summer school to the public via uh, the district website. There will be an announcement put out of the dates um, of summer school, which will be July 20th to August 14th. Um, locations will be both Blythe Park and uh, we'll have uh, both classes over at Hauser. Uh, logistically, uh, that works out because one class that's going to be offered is transition to Hauser. It makes sense since we have the opportunity to hold it there instead of holding it somewhere else and talk about a place they haven't been yet. We may as well have it here and they can experience the whole thing. Um, the other classes we're all going to be offering a robotics and coding class. The robotics materials are here given the um, expense of those items. Logistically speaking, it makes sense to keep those uh, devices here. The students can come over. Um, the important things to, to note that are going to happen starting tomorrow, this packet that I've passed out to you will be attached to the announcement as a PDF so that families in the community can uh, read through it. Um, what's going to happen next is hopefully by the end of the week, I will have a website launched for summer school. It will be attached to the district website. It will be up at the top. Um, it will be, well, actually it will be a tab where if you go to uh, schools and it lists all the schools at the bottom of that drop down box, it'll say summer school. It'll be a link that takes you to a page that will list not only the course offerings, but information for registration, which will be listed in both English and Spanish. So we have uh, registration forms in both. On Friday, the um, invitations for skill building will be sent out. They've already been delivered to schools. Uh, they will be released to students to go home to the families on Friday, um, indicating the courses that they're being recommended for and the price point that uh, they will be obligated to, to pay. We have a free reduced option for those students that qualify. Again, those forms are going home in both English and Spanish, um, which is something that we started doing last year. The staffing for uh, summer school will take place 
after the May 1st deadline for registration. Makes sense so that we know exactly who we're going to, or how many students we're going to have for any of the courses, whether it's skill building or enrichment. Then we can start allocating the best resources for each of those classes. As far as the invitations go for skill building, I have 268 approximately. I did a quick count this afternoon, 268 invitations going out. Now that doesn't mean that we have 268 students who are invited to both reading and math. It could be one or the other or both. If you'd like, I can detail that number more at a, at a later time. I just don't have it right now. But 268 approximate invitations are going out. Now, in the past, we haven't, we've never received 100% registration. We typically get about 50% or less. So that means that the class sizes on average will probably be around 15 to 16 students per grade level. The one thing that we're doing differently, I shouldn't say the one thing that we're doing differently, we're doing a few things differently this year, but one of the major things we're doing differently this year is we are not combining any of the grade levels for skill building. We will have a, a, first, a first grade classroom, second, third, fourth, all the way through incoming eighth grade classroom. In the past, it used to be a, com a combination of second and third, fourth and fifth, and then sixth, seventh, and eighth. That is um, past practice, it is not best practice. We're, that's one of the major changes that we're doing this year. We're also offering, um, for the first time in several years, I think, I think as a district we used to do it uh, maybe four or five years ago, but in uh, transition to kindergarten. We've been doing transition the first where we've been taking the kindergartners, kindergartners out, getting them ready for that full day school approach. Uh, but we haven't done anything in a long time that I know of for transition to kindergarten. So we have a lot of kiddos coming out of preschool that you know, kindergarten, even though it's still only half days, is quite a different experience. So we want to get them started with some of the number and letter recognition, you know, the basics in reading, um, number identification, things like that. So that will be offered this year as well. That class will, um, that's the only one of the skill building classes that is not an invite. Um, because we don't have the data. We don't have data coming out of preschool to say, okay, you know, these 65 children should be invited. We don't know We don't know who they are. So what we're going to do is we're going to, this is kind of a trial run this year. We're going to try it um, and cap it. The cap should be about 15 students. And then we'll see, you know, first come, first serve, and we'll just really see how it goes. The foundation that we're laying this year with the course offerings is something that we can build on in years going forward see what works, see what we need to tweak, because I think this is an opportunity that we can really take advantage of, see what the, uh, what the enrollment is, and, and figure out what we can offer going forward. This is a program that I would like to see become something that we just don't offer because we're a school district that should have summer school. Maybe this is something that we could offer in the future that draws not only our own students, but students from, from different places. So there's, there's a lot of things that could happen with it in front of you are the basics. Um, like I said, timeline is registration is ending on May 1st. Staffing should be done by June 1st based on what registration looks like. If for some reason we are unable to staff this properly with in-house, uh, we'll take a look at what we need to do to hire outside. And I would like to have that done by July 1st so that by July 20th when this whole thing starts, we're already good to go for a few weeks and we've had planning time with staff. We've been able to meet with staff and, and get things in order. So that's where we're at. Thank you very much. Um, so, Chairman, uh, I know we're not going to discuss this tonight, but uh, can we have some discussion at our next meeting? Sure. Uh, April 21st? At the April 21st board meeting. Yes. Yep. All right, so it has to very good. They'll be on, uh, on the down. agenda. All right, before we close the meeting, uh, announcements of future meeting dates. Uh, April 8th, immediately after this, will be a special meeting. Uh, April 21st will be the regular business meeting, 6.30, uh, well, 7 p.m. start time, but 6.30 p.m. for board members for uh, closed session. And then uh, May 5th, 2015, the biennial reorganizational uh, meeting at 7 p.m. in the LRC at Hauser Junior High. Uh, please note that pursuant to board policy 3416, 
a newly elected board members are to bring beer and ribs to outgoing. <laughs> <laughs> so well, thank you very much uh, for, for your time. May I have a uh, motion to uh, adjourn this meeting? So moved. Second. Meetings adjourned. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.